Well, thank you, Aaron. It's wonderful to be here. Jared, it's great to meet you, and um, I'm, I'm thrilled to have a chance to address you. And let me lead off with something I remembered as I was coming here. Uh, there's a story about Albert Einstein when he was lecturing as a professor. And in those days, the chauffeur would drive from university campus to university campus. We did not have Facebook or TikTok or anything like that, so nobody really knew what Albert Einstein looked like, but he would give this lecture. And they did it so often that the chauffeur finally said, um, you know, professor, I believe I can give your talk about special relativity uh, word for word. Now, apparently Einstein was kind of a practical joker, so he, he said, let's do it. <laughs> so they arrived at the university, and this was a, a particularly uh, aggressive university, very interested, and there was a particularly obnoxious student in the front who said uh, to, to uh, the lecturer, obviously the chauffeur, he said, so how is it, uh, professor, that you understood how acceleration and gravity have some relativity to each other. To explain that to me, where did you get that idea? And the chauffeur, undeterred and very smart, said, that is so easy, even my chauffeur in the back of the room there can answer the question. <laughs> so that's a bit the way, the way I feel here today, um, and because this is a room full of really remarkable people who are seizing the future, looking to the future, and, and I think the, the, the time that we have right now is a remarkable time. Uh, I can't really think of any time in our history when the challenges have been greater, the opportunities have been greater, the tools have been more accessible in the finances, and I know there are some investors in here. The finances, and I'll argue about this in a little bit, have, have never been more readily placed to do the right thing. Um, so we can, we can kind of go through that. But I do think that when you look at carbon capture and sequestration, whatever it may be, and I'll just give you a little bit of history of my experience with it, this is an incredibly important and foundational and really formative time. So go back to very early uh, a part of my life, a very close friend of mine still, a guy I used to climb mountains with, he was my camp counselor. At the time I thought he must be 30 something and he actually was 16, I was about 12, his name was Amory Lovins. And Amory and I have remained friends for years. And Amory, when he wrote Soft Energy Paths, actually said, I think you should meet Dave Brower. You grew up on a ranch, and therefore, you know, you, you might have a chance to, to work for, for Dave. So I went and argued with Dave Brower about what the importance of ranching was, how, uh, in fact, we could do great things with the ground. Um, that, that we weren't thinking about carbon capture at the time, but what we were thinking about was alternative energies. And at that time, Hamilton Standard and Boeing were standing up enormous, tiny by today's standards, but enormous wind generators that were throwing blades because how many of you have been to Wyoming? You, you know one of our greatest features, in fact, there's a t-shirt that has trees leaning like this saying, Why, welcome to Wyoming Wind Festival, January 1st to December 31st of every year. So you know we have, we have a lot of wind, and Hamilton Standard and Boeing were having real difficulty keeping the blades on those windmills in the 80s. And I remember at the time, everybody was saying, no, it'll never work. Nobody can ever have something that big. Now we have a similar drumbeat that's kind of happening where people are beginning to understand that when somebody says carbon capture is too expensive, it'll never work. We're seeing that that is changing. And I think a large part of that is because we have so many different technologies and so many different opportunities to come online it did seem like the right thing to do for Western governors, and just a little bit about Western governors. So it's a bipartisan organization. Governor Lujan Grisham from New Mexico is my vice chair, and the two of us share many of the same industries, and more importantly, those industries are what funds our education system. 
we recognize how important it is to have that income. And when a third of our income dropped off the planet and uh, at the advent of COVID, we understood exactly how challenging it was to be so dependent, about 80% dependent, on the mineral industry. So we are able to come to a common kind of approach. Now, both of us see that there is a cheap, being a Democrat and much more aligned, I think, with the Biden uh, agenda of getting a lot more uh, renewables on the landscape. We don't oppose them. We just don't sort of necessarily stand firm and say that's the only way we could do anything. Um, we are able to agree as to the other governors and Western governors. And so hopefully out of that, you have a bipartisan effort that is focused, and I've made this point over and over again, it is focused on solutions, not politics. It's not about position. It is about success. And when we think about how easy it is, some of the low-hanging fruit that we can gain by just looking at the wide landscape of opportunities that are out there for carbon capture. Now, we'll, we'll focus a little bit on, I, I really appreciated the conversation about pipeline infrastructure, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about, about that. It's also great that we have some real research that's going on, but none of this is terribly new. I used to work for a company just across the street here named Apache Oil, and one of the founders of that was a guy named Raymond Plank. And Raymond was thinking about this probably back in the late 80s and early 90s. In fact, the work we did on our grazing operation on land they had resulted in our ability to get about 2,640 metric tons sequestered every year by better grazing, not necessarily not, we were not talking about what we were doing with, with um, crop rotations, et cetera, which we also have been working on. But this was just doing a better job on our grazing. And it wasn't that hard to understand how we were getting carbon in the soil. There's a bunch of tests that are there. There's a lot of argument about what, what those tests really indicate and so on and so forth. We'll have to resolve those things. But the fact of the matter is, these are not new things, and it's low-hanging fruit. If we look at what we can do with our forests, even Gavin Newsom and I've had the conversation about, if you have uh, dead and dying forests, either they're decaying organically, by which they emit methane, one of those greenhouse gases, or they are uh, oxidizing, and they can oxidize over a number of years or in a few seconds, as we've seen over the last couple of years. In either case, they are carbon emitters. So we can do a better job of managing our forests, which doesn't necessarily mean they're totally uh, you know, row cropped or, or something else. It can be a managed forest, just growing more aggressively, capturing more carbon. And that's the part that Raymond was completely uh, thrilled about was the ability to get carbon in forests. He thought of himself as a Johnny Appleseed. So when you look at those technologies that are easily understood by agriculture, in fact, Secretary Purdue, uh, former Secretary Purdue, and current Secretary Vilsack and I have had a long conversation about how can we build a direct relationship between a consumer who might be interested in making sure that something more realistic than a carbon offset that he checks off or she checks off that actually can look at the soil or at the particular biologic community and understand that there is carbon that is substantively and actually being sequestered there and know that that's happening. Wyoming is working on tokenization to make sure that there is a direct relationship and this is very important to me because when we sold our 2,640 2, metric tons through the Chicago Climate Exchange, about 50% of what we could have made went to the exchange. Now, there was administration and research that had to go into that, but for the farmer or the rancher, having that more direct relationship is really key. But now let's talk about what the opportunity set is for what we see both in direct air capture what we can see in the research dollars that are going 
and ultimately I think how important it is that tax policy and indeed investment structure comes into play because this time right now has all of these amazing efforts. You've talked about many of them here. I'm fascinated to learn about more of, of, of what is happening around the globe now as people are realizing how important, in fact, the urgency. And I won't use the word crisis because we aren't there yet. We're at a time when we have to be diligent, purposeful, and driven to make sure that these, that these technologies, that this approach works right across the entire spectrum. So in Wyoming, early on, we recognized in the mid-90s that pore space was going to be a very critical element for anybody wanting to geologically sequester carbon. We built the first framework of laws around that, and those are now being emulated in many other places. We also understood that carbon capture at that time, we weren't really thinking about um, direct, direct air capture. We were looking at how to stand that up alongside existing point sources. That is still an endeavor that we have, and my predecessor, Governor Mead, was able to work with Basin Electric, a great cooperator, to build a new power plant and put adjacent to it a takeoff for, um, for the emission stream that has two major bays and about six experimental bays. Currently, uh, MTR, uh, Membrane Technology uh, re uh, Research, has got a uh, membrane technology apparatus that's working on capturing carbon. That is particularly thrilling in the West because it doesn't use as much water as the Kawasaki Heavy Industry Amine Project. Both of these are working here. Um, uh, you, you obviously have Terra, uh, Petronova uh, in North Dakota. You have another basin plant that's been operating for 20 years. And then it turns out that lots of different industries also do carbon capture just by, by way of doing what they do. So this technology is accessible. It can be scaled. And now it's a matter of understanding how we get the public to perceive it better. That's what's interesting about the challenge we face politically, which is why I'm so hopeful that Western Governors is able finally to be able to bring some real resonance to an issue that at this point is either no fossil, all fossil, um, direct air capture, climate is not an issue. I mean, there, there are all these different nuances that are bouncing around in the public framework when actually the easy way to approach this is we need electricity, we need energy, we need to be able to move forward aggressively, and we need to make sure that we do this with the best technology that we possibly can. One quick story, and this is about being honest. When we talk about our energy needs for the future, and when we talk about climate and carbon, it is absolutely essential that we do so honestly and understanding what the vocabulary means. So recently, I had the opportunity to speak to Harvard, and it was really about what we see in Wyoming as the incredible opportunity of being able to do a lot more with carbon sequestration and how important that's going to be to offset things that just aren't really that accessible. Things like aviation fuel. Yes, it's true that Airbus is looking at hydrogen and it is true that there are some renewables that are coming online. But the fact of the matter is the best benefit for that is coming from efficiency in jet engines and it's going to be a time before we're able to really depend on electrified avi uh, aviation or hydrogen aviation. There's a lot of research that has to go in there. And in the meantime, we should drive forward very quickly. So this was what I was talking about in Wyoming's commitment to be net negative. It is a means to address what emissions are in the atmosphere. And we need to understand what that is. We need to understand what the costs are and 
We also know that there's a very long time span for the investment. And this is where the revenues and the investment dollars that have gone into so many of our sovereign funds, Texas Teachers, Wyoming's Permanent Land, Alaska, um, Norway, this is where that very long hold can come into play to make sure that our new emerging technologies have the chance to mature into the marketplace with a way to achieve what we all need to do, which is to make sure that we do something about carbon emissions. I thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. And as I say, at the, as I said at the beginning, you know, the chauffeur over there knows more than I do about this. But the means and the need to get this done at a time when we have energy needs that are start, starting to skyrocket once again with AI, with data centers, when we look at what transportation is going to require, you hold the future. And thank you.